I'm Claudia Catania, and you're listening to Playing On Air. Clarence Sasser, adapted and performed by Stephen Lang from his play Beyond Glory. Here we have the harrowing story of Clarence Sasser, a combat medic in the Vietnam War. He was awarded the Medal of Honor in 1969. This is Clarence Sasser's recounting of the incident that earned him that medal, in his own words, performed by Stephen Lang. It's not very glamorous. No, sir, it isn't. It is not a good story. But then, I guess it's consistent with war. Laying in the rice paddy that night, the little group I was in, maybe six or seven guys, they told me I did a good job. They told me they were going to see that I get a medal chef with You take that with a grain of salt. I did what I did because it was my job. And if I didn't do it, none of us were going to get out. At least, that's what I felt. I still stand with that. I have no idea at what point the other medics were killed. January 10, 1968. We're part of a battalion-sized search-and-destroy mission, 3rd Battalion, 60th Infantry, my company, Alpha Company, 106 men. We said to be back up. We're going to have an easy time of it that day, but uh, it got bad pretty quick. They had us surrounded on three sides, and all their mortars, that's primarily what they had, mortars, was zeroed in on the rice paddy along with the 30 caliber machine guns and of course the K-47 and man, they started chopping us up immediately. Guys are dropping like flies, hollering, medic, medic, doc, doc. First guy got to us badly hurt, shot through the chest, a sucking chest wound. After I bandaged him, I told him to try to keep his head above water, except this guy's half in and half out of consciousness. Yeah, but that's all you can do. Stabilize a trauma situation and move on. I went from one guy to the next and on to the next and so on, and then I'll go back to check on them. Now, the water in the rice paddy is knee deep, so you can't move with any dispatch. Uh-uh. And a monkey sucking the boots right off your feet, so I had to belly crawl like a reptile, grab handfuls of rice paddy, drag myself along, and the whole time, man, bullets are flying, mortars coming in, snipers all around. And it's not like you can return fire. Uh-uh. I mean, you can't set your mortar or machine gun in that muck. Only thing you can do is keep your head down, wait for night to fall, hope that the moon ain't full. We're out there more than 12 hours, and only 12, 12, 14, 14, 14 men. 14 men out of 106 come in without being killed or wounded. I was the only medic that lived. I got a bullet in the back of the leg at the outset. Not too bad. A couple hours into it, I got sprayed with shrapnel from a mortar hit. My shoulder, my back, and my hip, and my leg. And man, that hurting was something, because you know when a mortar shell explodes, that shit's hot. I mean, real hot and racket, those fragments tearing and burning. But unless a shell fragment hits an artery or nervous, more aggravation and pain than life-threatening. After a while, it got so quiet. The fighting would wax and wane. So I raised up to look, and that's when a sniper got me right here on top of the skull, and the bullet bounced off. And I was not wearing a helmet, but I would say that the bullet bounced. Just the, 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 the angle, it, 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 it glanced off. It bled like crazy, man. It left me with one hell of a headache, yeah. Well, you know what the hardest thing was? The hardest thing was laying there all night, listening to them beg for their mamas. All these young men crying out for their mummies. That's the perversity of it, you see. Them telling me I did a good job when all these soldiers are dying. 
It's not very glamorous. No, sir, it isn't. It is not a good story. But then I guess it's consistent with war. Words. Words like bravery, courage. They come after the fact. They are retrospective type words. I think the biggest thing you find if you read the citation is that there was a feeling that somebody had to do something. I did what I did because it was my job. And if I didn't do it, none of us were going to get out. My name is Clarence Sasser. You just heard Clarence Sasser, performed by Stephen Lang from his play Beyond Glory. Stephen's right here with us. Thank you, Stephen, for staying to talk. Clarence Sasser was trying to help a group of about 106 in his company, but he and they were knee-high in a rice paddy. So right. How could that work? I don't think it worked very well at all, but he did what he, he did what he had to do. I mean, you try to, I mean, as he said, I, I, I'm trying to get this guy to keep his head above water, but he keeps losing consciousness. So, you know, some guys, look, it's a, I, you're, I'm doing a 10 minute piece about what was a 14 hour uh, ordeal. And uh, a lot of men, a lot of men, look, 106 men went in and 14 came out without being killed or wounded. So how many of those wounded guys would have died had Clarence not put that sulfide on mm-hmm. on the wound, had not you know staunched the bleeding here, mm-hmm. had not dragged that guy so he wouldn't drown to death, had not cleared his trachea or whatever it is. That we don't know, uh, or I don't know. And I know mm-hmm. Clarence. I've spoken to him about this, these events many times. And um, he did the best he he did the best he could, and and what he did was he got he got awarded for effort. And you know, of course, you know the Medal of Honor itself. It's above and beyond the Call of Duty, which is to say that nobody, if you didn't do what you did, nobody would hold it against you. Nobody expects you to do it. So here you've got a medic, because now a medic's job is to you know tend tend the wounded. Were there, do what he can to save the men. But the situation there was so dire that if he had just remained pinned down and trying and serve the guys who were within his immediate sort of arm reach mm-hmm. or something like that, he would do it. I mean, he got shot in the head. He got mm-hmm. blasted by, been enough. you know, and he carries the wounds to this day. I mean, I've seen him take shrapnel <laughs> out of his head. Oh, gosh. He says a wonderful thing also. He says, he's, uh, Clarence will say, uh, he says, I am... Um, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I received the Medal of Honor for saving lives rather than taking lives. Not that I have a problem with taking lives <laughs> if that's what the job is, but my job was saving lives. So Clarence is still alive. What, what does he think about being portrayed by a white guy? Is it something he ever mentioned to you? When I did this show, when I first conceived and wrote this show, 2003 and 2004, all eight of the recipients were alive. Clarence has seen the show uh, three times, and he really digs the show. And because of the nature of the show, it's, it's an interesting question you ask. I thought at some point, this is going to be addressed by someone, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it never has been because people... They get it. They, they get what I'm doing. Yeah. And, um, you know, I tell a joke, uh, in the, not in the show, but when I do it for the troops, they know me as a rule from my film work or my work on television, and they want to hear a bit about that. So I sort of do an annotated mm-hmm. thing. And one of the things I tell is a story about Vernon Baker. Now, Vernon Baker was a member of the 96th the Buffalo Division, uh, a black man who from the time he went in in the army in 41 was, uh, you know, a victim of systematic prejudice in the army, racial prejudice. 50 years after the event in 1997 was recognized 
by President Clinton, one of seven with the Medal of Honor. And as he says, you know, s- seven, medals w- seven medals were awarded that day, but I was the only one still walking around. You know, no blacks were awarded the Medal of Honor during World War II. Uh, mm. So, and, I, and when I tell the story, I, I, I never met uh, Vernon Baker. He signed off on this, but I actually never met Vernon. But I always imagined that I'd go up to his house, and he lived in the woods. He was kind of a loner, and he always had his M1 with him. <laughs> and uh, if I always imagined that I knock on the door, and he he comes to the door, and I say, "Hello, uh, Mr. Baker. Um, my name is Stephen Lang, and um, uh, well, I'm going to be portraying you in Beyond Glory." And he kind of looks me up and down, and uh, takes a pause, and finally says, "Well, I always thought it would be Morgan, <laughs> or maybe Denzel, but you would certainly be my third choice." You know? <laughs> So, and that too, you know, it's funny. I tell that I tell that joke now, or that story, and it's become part of the part of the gig. I guess I've been moving off script <laughs> over the years. It's nice to know that Clarence Sasser saw this piece three times. You mentioned, did Larry Smith ever see it? Larry's seen it a hundred times. And, and, <laughs> he loves it. And I'll tell you this: oh, you bet he loves it. He's also sold a lot of books. Yeah. You know, because we, you know, it's just part of the fun. You know, I take yeah. it out on the road now. Places like Aiken, South Carolina, Texarkana, uh, you name it. We've we've right. been all over. Do you know? We'll do twenty two dates in uh, you know twenty four days. It's fun and I mean exhausting, and it's old time theater stuff. You know, and and people come out to see it because this is really it is a heartland show. And do you find that those military settings and that particular audience informs your performance in a, in a unique way? Well, from a performance point of view, it does very much because I've performed in some very weird places. Uh, back in 2005, I did uh, back-to-back performances, I mean, right after one and after another, in the hangar deck of the USS Carl Vinson, which was the nuclear carrier that was flying combat missions into Iraq. At the time, the hangar deck is right below the flight deck. It's like playing in the biggest garage, you know, in the world, and they had angled two F-16s. They, they really liked it. They do it right for you. They'd taken two F-16s, angled right towards me on the dais they built, and behind it, they, they hung a 40 by 60 American flag, the only time that I've ever played it with a flag. So to fill that hall, and it was about 114 degrees in there, I lost nine pounds that day doing that show, doing those two back to back. And uh, so that presents its own sort of challenge. And, and so it's got, so, so, so the answer that comes to me has less to do with the emotional effect of the material than it does with the, the, just the Isn't absolute just strangeness of the place I played. And, Taking to Guantanamo Bay, for goodness sake. Uh, and they, first of all, they just, the troops absolutely appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to come there. Right. That means something to them. Also, they get into it because they've never seen anything quite like this before. Guys will come up to me and say, you know, you know, this is like the best play I ever saw. Well, it's, it's the, the second best play I ever saw. The best play I ever saw was my sister when she did The Music Man, you know, in junior high. That was really right. great. That was the best. But that's, this was really good, too. That's why we're doing Playing on Air for that very reason. You've been listening to Playing on Air, great American short plays with great American actors. Clarence Sasser is from the one-man play Beyond Glory by Stephen Lang, adapted from the book of the same name by Larry Smith. It featured actor Stephen Lang, recording by John Kilgore, sound design by Ron Rogel, theme music by Tom Cochan, associate producer Michelle O'Brien, literary manager Bonnie Antosh. Visit our website at playingonair.org, find us on Facebook or Twitter at Playing On Air, and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. And while you're there, leave us a review and let us know what you think of the show. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. I'm series producer Claudia Catania. <laughs>